So before moving into the uh, talk, I'll give you a brief intro. As most of the, uh, one of the most pressing drivers which impact life in the ocean is marine debris. That is uh, both land-based as well as sea-based sources and has tangible and wide-reaching impacts affecting uh, marine areas all over the world. And the prevalence of marine debris is visible in many areas, including coastlines, ports, open gas, and even the uh, deepest trenches. And the effect of marine debris is not only aesthetic, it has also a very serious impact on several marine organisms, their habitat, ecosystem, even on the human health as well as their general well-being. And the sources of marine debris, they range uh, from land-based waste disposal, then from various fishing vessels, fishing gears, uh, natural and anthropogenic disasters, etc. And they are omnipresent in ocean. Now, why studying them is important? Actually, it's not visible directly and hence should be investigated in detail before it get uh, worsened. And the ocean energy, the tidal waves and tidal action, they break the larger uh, plastic debris into macroplastic and these macro, they are further broken down into microplastic and into nanoparticles. So uh, when making up a plastic, uh, when making up a plastic material, there are so many toxins are added to it, like phthalates, plasticizers, added several additives, colorants, all these are added to it. So there are several toxins contained in them. Now, uh, by the process of eaten and being eaten, these uh, toxins contained in them, they get biomagnified. And so it's not easy to manage, thus affecting the marine environment uh, by threatening the ocean health and uh, food safety, and quality, human health, coastal tourism, and it also contributes to the climate change. Now, any persistent solid material that is manufactured or processed, either directly or indirectly, intentionally or unintentionally, which is abandoned into the marine environment, forms the marine debris. So it can be of any type, like uh, starting from plastic bag to medical waste, glass, plastic bottles, even the beverages can, uh, ghost net, various, nets, various waste from uh, oil rigs as well as from cruise ships. And the majority of the marine debris forms a uh, plastic. That is almost 80% of the marine debris is formed up of plastic. And uh, out of this, almost 80% of the pollution was land-based and only 20% uh, form, was formed from various uh, maritime sources or catastrophic events. Now, by different methods, these plastic, uh, these marine debris reaches the ocean. Uh, usually when trashes are left directly in the beaches, from there it may reach the ocean. And then they, sometimes they may be carried away um, through the rainwater, through canals or rivers. Sometimes they are blown away from the, by wind from the land. Accidents do happen in the ocean, uh, like uh, accidents from oil rigs, uh, then from fishing vessels, etc. do happen. Now, ghost nest. Ghost nest means those uh, um, torn ones or the lost nets, uh, which are thrown by the fishermen into the sea. They form the ghost nest. They also pose severe problem. So, as I told you earlier, they are omnipresent in nature. They are seen everywhere in almost every part of the ocean, from coastal areas, open sea, deep sea, in the remotest island, in sensitive zones like coral reef. Uh, so, they, they do not remain in one place. They actually circulate through the water currents by the wave action. And also, I told you uh, there are so many chemicals in the plastic. In addition to these chemicals, they also have the capacity to uh, bioaccumulate and biomagnify uh, most of the chemicals which are seen in the surrounding water. So that is another problem. So there's difficult in, difficulty in surveying and monitoring. Now, and the percentage of cetacean and the seabird species which are affected by the marine debris, uh, the consumption of these plastic marine debris, uh, they, are, they have risen uh, to 40% to 44% respectively. And uh, globally, over a million bags of plastics, they are used annually. And the fishing industry itself dumps around 1,50,000 tons of plastic into the ocean annually. Now, uh, we are continuing to use the plastic in various forms. I think we have, uh, at least in Kerala, we have banned the single-use plastic items. But uh, still, we are continuing to use the plastic in different uh, modes, like uh, plastic wrappers, um, uh, food which we order from the restaurant, um, different types of uh, plastic tiffin box, then uh, plastic bottles which we drink water from. So we are continuing to do so. So if the present trend of plastic production is continuing to do so, and uh, we shall have more plastic in the ocean than fishes by the year 2050. So that was, this was stated in the World Economic Forum in the year 2016. Now a new term has been coined known as a platysphere. 
So this is a term uh, that is used to refer to the ecosystem that have evolved to live in human-made plastic environments. And this was uh, this term was put forward by Schlunder uh, et al. in the year 2019. Now I think you have heard about the mega rafting. That is a spread of invasive species over across the plastic uh, debris. Actually, in the year 2011, in the East Japan, a massive earthquake uh, occurred and. Uh, uh, because of the earthquake, uh, tsunami was launched and an extraordinary transoceanic biological rafting occurred. As a result, uh, and the scientists have published this in the um, um, science, and they have documented almost 289, more than 289 living species, including from fishes to smaller organisms. They travel from Japan to North American shows in six years since the disaster. So all these six years, these living organisms have been traveling from Japan to North American shores. So many came on plastic or some other unknown biodegradable objects, etc., like ships, rocks, dogs, etc., that were carried out into the sea during this uh, destruction, during the tsunami. So the scientists call this phenomenon uh, the mega rafting, and they worried that the increase in the marine debris uh, uh, combined with the climate change will speed up the pace of uh, coastal species invasions. Now, this pie chart shows the source of microplastic in the marine environment. You can see that almost 35%, the major component, that is 35% is formed of synthetic textile. Uh, um, major source of the microplastic was from synthetic textile industry, that is 35%. And then uh, from the car tires, when these tires, uh, uh, tires of cars and buses and lorries, when they uh, wear off, the small, small micro particles will come uh, and they ultimately they reach the ocean. And again, city dust, which cause several um, uh, problems. Again, they also carry um, plastic. Uh, then the paint, which we use to uh, mark on the road, they also contain plastic. Then the marine coatings, the paint with which we uh, paint on the hull of the ship. Then again, the personal care products like uh, uh, certain face wash, certain toothpaste, all these contain some plastic beads. Again, these are also harmful. Ultimately, what happens is all these plastic waves, they finally uh, reaches the ocean. So this microplastic, they are actually high polymer plastic particles. They are ranging in a size below five millimeter. And they are actually of two kinds, primary microplastic and secondary microplastic. Now, primary means those which are manufactured in the form of plastic, microplastic itself. That is, examples are uh, micro beads, capsules, fibers, etc. And the secondary one means those existing macroplastic that uh, break down into secondary microplastic. So this happens when the plastic waves, when they are exposed to the UV light of sunlight or when it, it is exposed to the tidal action or the wave action, these uh, macroplastics, pl they break down into still smaller fragments. So they form the secondary microplastic. Now these uh, microplastics, they are different, uh, they can be categorized into different types based on their shape. Microfiber, microfragment, micropellet, microfilm, microfoam, and microbead. Now, when you look into the global release uh, of uh, plastic into the ocean, you can see that if the population and the technology is higher, you can see larger the amount of plastic released into the ocean. So you can see that India and Southeast, uh, South Asia have more popula uh, highly populated, and also the technology has is also highly developed, especially in countries like China. So there, the release of uh, carbon will be, uh, release of uh, marine debris will be more than the um, African and Middle East countries where population and technology is really less. Now, this figure shows the uh, sources and pathway of uh, the origin of plastics and uh, finally how it ends in the ocean. You can see uh, factories uh, and uh, plastic remains from household remains. Uh, Ultimately, they reach in the ocean where they where these large plastic macro particles they are broken down into micro particles. And what happens when these micro plastic when they reaches the ocean? What happens is a thin biofilm will be formed on the surface. Uh, biofilm of bacteria will be formed on the surface, and uh, these uh, birds and smaller aquatic or uh, minute aquatic organisms like zooplankton they mistake they mistook these plastic particles for food and they engulf it. That is how the primary consumers, they um, uh, consume these plastics. Then they reach the secondary consumers and that it will go on. And uh, here the ship also release, uh, the, 
plastic will be generated from the fishing nets and all that. Then even plastic can be known, microplastic can be known in the oceanic gas. So here, so that is how the microplastic travel from land to ocean. Now this pie chart show uh, what the different kinds of aquatic life which are impacted by uh, plastic. That is almost 2,249 species are affected by plastic litter and over 300 tons of plastic are produced every year for different uses. Now, most of the impacted species are uh, impacted organisms are mammals, birds, fishes, crustaceans, and mollusks. And uh, some of them, uh, some of the uh, organisms, they ingest plastics, whereas others, they, uh, they get entangled by the plastic debris, causing uh, death. Now, several studies have demonstrated, that is, several experimental studies have shown that even the microplastics, where they were translocated, that is, once they consume the plastic, they were even translocated to the circulatory system, and sometimes they might even reach the tissues. So, right from the cyanobacteria, sea anemones, crustaceans, uh, algae, single cell eukaryotes, sponges, uh, then from, uh, from these smaller organisms up to mammals, these uh, aquatic life, they are seriously impacted by the plastics. Now we'll see what are the effects of encounters with the plastic. You know, when they, when these aquatic organisms, they take in large amount of plastic, the problem is their stomach will be filled with plastic and they'll be, they find it difficult to move. So they show sluggish movements. And uh, sometimes when they get entangled with the plastic, they find it difficult to breathe and uh, oxygen uptake will be less and they find it difficult to breathe then it affects the community or the population structure. And uh, I told you about the bio uh, film will be formed on the plastic surface. So similarly, several aquatic organ um, uh, invasive species may also get stuck up on the surface of these plastic and they get dispersed to distant places. So, uh, then if they reduce the food intake, that will uh, obviously lead to the less of um, less growth in the yeast organisms. Then, when they ingest sharp uh, plastic by uh, microplastic like particles, their body gets several lacerations, and due to get due to that, they get several external as well as internal injury. As a result, ultimately they die. And some of the physiological changes will also take place uh, because I already told you that several uh, toxins are contained in these plastics, like uh, phthalates, plasticizers, um, then in order to give stability, in order to give color, certain dyes are used. So several physiological changes also take place, affecting the reproductive, uh, reproductivity. Uh, then, uh, um, like in muscle studies, the certain experiment showed that these plastic particles, they are also carried to different parts of the body. Now, these are the different types of uh, marine litter affecting the marine uh, life, like uh, fisheries from the fishery sector itself, nets, met metals, then glass, ceramics, then textile industry, fab, uh, timber industry from uh, cigarette butts, styrofoam, packing materials, all these are different kinds of litter which affect the marine life. Now, majority of the studies of these plastic, they are limited to marine debris, including macroplastic. Only a few studies are there on the uh, microplastic impact on the marine biodiversity and still less a number on the nanoplastics. Now, the major question is how to detect the uh, microplastic in the aquatic animals, or whether it's in water or sediment or in aquatic animals. So, Actually, first you have to take the sample and you have to digest whatever organic matter is present in the sample, you have to digest it. And there are several methods for digestion. That is, uh, acid method is there, alkaline method is there, enzymatic or oxidizing digestion is there. Different kinds of methods are there. Then you go for density separation and then filter the samples using um, uh, uh, filter paper or Wadman's filter paper. And then the samples should be picked with metal forceps. You should be very careful to pick the samples with metal forceps. Do not touch brush or any other material. Use metal forceps or glass, something which is made up of only glass or metal and should be placed in glass vials. And later, these they should be double washed with diesel water and they should be analyzed under ATR, FTIR spectrometer. And if the size of the plastic is much smaller, then you have to go for Raman spectroscopy because for very small size of uh, uh, microplastic size, it's difficult to get a uh, good uh, spectrograph. 
Now below you can, then the identification of the microplast can be made by comparing it with the sample from the Bruker spec, FTR spectral library. Now below you can see two spectrographs, that's a, a FTR spectro, um, from the obtained from the FTR spectrometer. One is of the polypropylene and other is of um, nylon. See in the graph you can see several wavelengths marked. So these wavelengths show what kind of polymer uh, the particular plastic material contains. Now, understanding the fate of micro and nanoplastic is necessary for a better understanding of this distribution of uh, plastic pollution and disposition of plastic pollution. Now, there are several increasing evidence of microplastic, which uh, has been hazardous to the aquatic environment as well. So, you know, so they, they have become benchmark tools for policy made, makers to make, mitigate foreseen problems of uh, microplastic contaminations. And 89% uh, of the impacts were at suborganismal level from micro and nanoplastic, and only 11% uh, was affected by the larger debris, like entanglement in ropes, uh, netting, or death uh, because of larger items. No studies were conducted, or fewer studies, lesser studies were conducted on the impact of the ecosystem level. Now, there are several Indian examples as well. Uh, there's sediment samples of Vempanad Lake in Kerala. It's a very important study. And that's uh, almost uh, in every square meter, it has been reported that 266 microplastic particles were reported. That was by Shruti and Ramasamy in the year 2018. Now, several scientists have recovered plastic from the gut of dozens of fish species um, from east as well as from the western coast of uh, India. Uh, we have also conducted several studies on the microplastic uh, ingestion by, yeah, especially in uh, invasive fishes, several invasive fishes. Now, ingestion of my microplastic, we know that fishes as well as other vertebrates, even the smaller invertebrates, they have been feeding on this microplastic as well as nanoplastic. Now, several experimental studies have also shown a list of zooplankton, arthropods, mollusks, and sediment and worms uh, consuming these microplastic. So along with this phytoplankton interaction, these microplastics, they affect the sedimentation rate also. Now, uh, again, another experimental studies showed that when fleas were exposed to uh, round beads, microplastics, uh, steroid, uh, um, round beads, they are uh, end of irregularly shaped plastic fragments, they uh, consumed these plastic pieces and they, they got stuck in their gut. Now, even the corals, they are seen to consume uh, microplastic, especially in this uh, context of climate change. Now, the primary consumers, which are made up of bacteriovorous, herbivorous, herditativorous, and uh, deposit feeding species, they actually feed on, uh, forage on this particulate matter. So they have the capacity to ingest more of these microparticles because they uh, forage on the particulate matter. And the direct ingestion of microplastic uh, is a major route for primary uh, and secondary consumers, while the top predators, they are actually, um, we can say that they have indirect ingestion of these microplastics uh, via the food web through the process of eaten and being eaten. So uh, the top predators, uh, they have indirect ingestion, whereas the Prime, primary and the secondary consumers, they have di direct ingestion. And the intake of food and microplastics, they depend upon uh, various complex interactions between the biotic, several biotic and abiotic factors. Now, uh, microplastics, they are made up of different kinds of polymers like a polyethylene, polystyrene, PET, polyethylene, uh, terephthalate, PVC, polypropylene, etc., from various sources. And thus they represent a plethora of material, material characteristics. So in general, the plastic materials, they are highly functional compounds of synthetic polymers. Uh, like I told you earlier, they consider different additives like plasticizers, flame retardants, colorants, all these have been added. Also, uh, studies have proven that leachates from the uh, plastic products, they were found to contain several chemicals with highly toxic chemicals, which are induced by monomers residues of production processes like catalyzers, stabilizers, etc. They are usually added when this plastic product is formed. So some leaching compounds were classified as endocrine disrupting chemicals. And this also I told you earlier, certain phthalates, bisphenol, etc. has been added and they adversely affect the uh, several um, physiological parameters like reproductive capacity and all that. These endocrine uh, disrupting chemicals are very harmful. Now, uh, earlier I told you about the term plastisphere uh, put forward by Schlund et al. in the year 2019. So when uh, any um, 
uh, small kind of uh, small plastic particle when when it goes into the ocean a thin layer of uh, bacteria or microbes they get coat have get a coating and the later uh, this uh, the fate of this microplastic is usually judged by the biofilm form that is either to sink or to float or or even uh, further breaking them into smaller pieces so actually very little is known about the, the kind of microbes in the platysphere or how they interact with one another and also with the plastic so the most dominant important phyla colonizing the microplastic they include the proteobacteria cyanobacteria and bacteriodes and um, especially the platysphere microbial communities they were heterogeneously mixed uh, providing the first glimpse of bacterial interaction Uh, in the second and the third picture, these these are the same pictures of the uh, microplastics. You can see certain pits on the pictures. These pits are due to the plastic degradation. Now, a new customized and extended technology has been developed, known as a classifish, that is a combinatorial labeling and spectral imaging fluorescence in situ hybridization. Now, earlier we were telling about the aquatic organism, but uh, among the top predators like even the whales the sharks and the larger octopus species even they are, they cannot escape the ruinous embrace of uh, humanity's plastic waste so hundreds of sharks have been reported as uh, falling victim to entangling uh, entangle in this fishing gear and other plastic debris so killing from sea turtles to gray whales now about 1% of the plastic in the ocean float on the surface and most of the rest of the plastic they sink into the ocean surface so the ocean currents and other uh, near sea flow uh, they appear to control where the sinking plastic they end up so it depends upon the uh, ocean oceanic current so it's very important that we develop a basic understanding of the process there is a distribution of the microplastic we should understand first the control uh, the um, process that control the distribution of the microplastic only then we can have a better understanding and how these tiny fragments they enter the food chain through the marine life so actually the, these microplastic they often accumulate on the deep sea floor uh, in the same place where uh, where they have a dense marine life communities and this is because the same this same submarine sediment that flows um, uh, sed sediment flows that transfer the oxygen and nutrients in order to sustenance of the life they transport the microplastic from urban rivers to the deep sea flow now this is a very good example that we should follow uh, the the man uh, behind the world's first biggest beach cleanup that's afrosha actually uh, in the picture in the third picture you can see the versova beach in the year 2015 you can see the um, state of the beach in versova and now in the year 2018 you can see how clean it is the mumbai people they got a very beautiful beach because of this person afrosha he was a he is a lawyer and uh, he started this uh, individually that is he started to clean the beach individually and later several uh, slum dwellers politicians and uh, movie stars they uh, they also joined him and they uh, clean the beach um, and uh, um, they even continue to do so and he has conducted several awareness class for the not only for the children but also the several beach side settlements are there near the versova beach uh, so they even try to educate them about the effects of littering these plastic and turn them into zero waste communities so what he believe is uh, the problem is not with the plastic but the problem is our empathy towards plastic or how we handle the plastic and uh, actually it's the people they have to change their mindset so that is what he says so this is a uh, example which we can follow now the how to manage these microplastic and the way ahead so there are several complex questions and economic philosophies so maintain demand for new plastic i think even now we have a high demand for new plastic so uh, we cannot uh, blame put the blame on the uh, producers because still there is a high demand for plastic now incinerating post, post consumer material again incinerating uh, plastic is yet another problem causing climate change because uh, um it results in the uh, production of large amount of uh, greenhouse gases thus um, increasing the climate change uh, um, affecting the climate change then uh, recycling regulated design and producer responsibility of refusal and replacement uh, the producers what they do is they only produce things they don't have the responsibility to recycle or um, uh, um, to re recycle the products 
So life cycle of plastic in social justice contest and the rag pickers, they also had to be very careful because they, uh, they are the ones um, who get a variety of diseases from these different um, materials along with the marine uh, litter. So some of the sources could be started by effective uh, legislation, like uh, you can ban, uh, ban microbeads, which are seen in the toothpaste, um, face wash, etc. Also education and uh, regulation enforcement, litter laws. If we go to uh, any uh, foreign country, like, a Singap like Singapore or some other European countries, uh, they never litter anything. But what we do in our roads and in the beach, we just uh, drink water from a bottle and then throw it away. Uh, if you have a cover, we have a carry bag and you were eating some, something from the bag later, you just throw it away. You never bother where you are throwing the litter. You never take it home. Or you never keep it in a uh, waste bin. So there should be some litter laws and technological advancements. Uh, and microplastic, they ultimately they reaches the aquatic uh, environment through the supply chain that is in the form of pre-production pellet littering or irresponsible waste management. Now, uh, again, we, now we have a ban for single uh, use items. Still, uh, you can keep a fee for such items. Then uh, certain items can again can be banned like uh, plastic uh, bags, micro beads, then uh, plastic cutleries, all these can be banned. Then, uh, uh, in the new materials can be innovated, manufactured and recycling the product is another alternative. So eco labeling and certification scheme can be done. Then campaign using various media, then uh, along with the uh, involving religious institutions, education, education, then uh, we can also employ certain ambassadors for taking up these ocean campaigns. Then uh, various awareness pro program can be conducted. Also, there's an urgent need to explore the uh, use of the existing legally binding international agreement to address this uh, um, global pollution. Now, recycling and reuse of plastic product is also uh, very necessary to replace single use plastic. They are also necessary to prevent the uh, single use plastic produce, production. Now, uh, there are some technical solutions, but the question is will it work or not? That's the question. So, uh, floating nets are used to capture debris in the ocean. But we don't know how much of the plastic could be uh, collected through from that net. Now, plastic to fuel pyrolysis machines uh, are there on the ocean going barges. Again, we don't know how much they could do. Now, certain type of bacteria, they are um, fed into the sea, they are put into the sea, uh, sea which consume uh, uh, polyethylene, polyethylene terephthalate, poly, uh, polypropylene, etc. Again, we don't know how much quantity of this plastic these bacteria could consume. So all these are different uh, uh, solutions, but uh, we don't know. Sometimes they fail in several fronts. Uh, most of them are economically not uh, viable. It's costly. So minimizing ecological impact maybe and design and testing it in real ocean conditions is really difficult. Now, fishing for the litter was uh, presented as the only viable ocean cleanup program and is described as a useful last option in the hierarchy. But we can only address certain types of marine litter. Not all uh, litter cannot be collected with the help of um, ocean cleanup. And most scientists and policy makers and the ocean cleanup is not economically or uh, logically feasible according to them. Now we have a program set up by the Fisheries Department of Kerala and uh, Fish Board Operators Association. That is program is known as uh, Sujitwa Sangram or the Clean Sea Project. So um, whenever these fishermen, when the trawlers, they go to sea, um, their, their, trawler, their trawl nets um, along with the uh, uh, marine resources, these nets, they also contain several plastic materials. In earlier days, they used to throw away all these plastic into the sea and they come back. But now, because of this program, they collect all these plastic junk and they collect it back to the harbor. And from the harbor, the women who are um, the ladies in the Kudumbashri unit, with the help of these uh, ladies, what they do is they um, sort out the plastic, they clean it, then they place it in the shredding machine and turn it into material, and then they, are, you, they shred it and then they are used for making roads. So this is a uh, good project taken up by the government. Now there are several alternatives to the plastic, that is pressed hay can be used as egg carton, then banana leaf, bamboo packaging, even seaweeds which are edible, they can also be used for packaging. Mushroom packaging is there, they can, they can replace even the styrofoam packing. 
then um, uh, wood cleaning brushes, kitchen utensils can be used. Then uh, stainless steel cup can be used and bottles can be used instead of plastic ones. Then bee bags coated clothes, they can be uh, used for plastic wrap and plastic bags. Then truly biodegradable water bottle is there. On the top, you can see a water bottle that is made up of agar agar. So when you once the water is filled in the bottle, it will be in the shape of bottle. And if there is no water, it will uh, shrink. And if you want, you can eat the bottle also. It, actually, it's edible. It's made up of agar agar. So it is completely biodegradable. Now there is another one I think uh, most of you have seen the last picture, algae derived water drinking device. That's a OHO, shaping liquids into sphere by placing frozen water into calcium chloride and brown algae solution. That is another uh, technology. Now the certain edible cutleries are used in Hyderabad and all that. They are made up of three flows like uh, rice, millet, sorghum, etc. Now, there are bioplastic and biodegradable part, degradable plastics. Now, the bioplastics, they are made from renewable materials like uh, orange peel, corn oil, so soya beans, microorganism, uh, starch, etc. Whereas biodegradable plastic, they are actually, they are made from uh, traditional petrochemicals, but uh, they are designed in such a way that uh, certain additives are added to them so that they will, uh, the rate of decay or the breakdown process will be speed and uh, uh, it would be at a much faster pace in the presence of oxygen and light. But again, complete biodegradation needs commercial facilities. Uh, also, the problem with these uh, alternatives is they are very uh, expensive and they have the potential to make the, again, uh, if it is, suppose you get a cover like this and it is written biodegradable. And what you do is you throw away that particular cover or a particular um, cup and again, it will take certain time to uh, uh, undergo degradation. Meanwhile, it may, it may get entangled into some other organism or it may get inside the uh, body of some other, uh, they have some um, seabird or whale or mammal get accidentally ingest these marine organisms or they, they get entangled into it. So again, uh, littering is another problem. So, We'll see the emerging questions in the future research. Uh, national policy on the single-use plastic and microplastic for India is, is a better option. And, and another thing is a standardization of the protocol of microplastic detection is necessary. Uh, different researchers use different uh, protocols. That is uh, yet another problem. But again, that depends upon the depends upon on uh, one's choice and uh, the kind of work they do. And then uh, a better knowledge and database on plastic sphere should be made. And also networking of institutions, different institutions can come together and they can document the microplastic diversity and the impacts uh, and the chemical contamination and ecosystem impact. And uh, multidisciplinary thinking is necessary for, uh, for our future and involving uh, not only uh, the scientists, but also the citizen scientists in monitoring and promoting the linkage along with the academic institutions. Now, when come to think about the zero waste hierarchy, you can uh, always, the three R's are very useful, like reduce, reuse, and recycle. So that will improve the waste recovery and uh, thereby we can um, uh, prevent the loss to east, uh, microplastic to the environment. So other than natural degradation in the environment, like uh, UV rays of the sunlight, oxidation, um, uh, breakage, degradation, etc. There are other activities which also create microplastic, like uh, mis uh, uh, I think right from the site of uh, industries itself, right from where they uh, release these waste materials, uh, distribution sites, then uh, vehicle tire dust, shavings in the plastic product, then uh, all these personal care products like toothpaste, face wash, etc. from uh, textile mills, they also produce these pre-production pellets. So these, um, they lack specific method of measurement. So there's no sp special me measurement is there for at the time of the uh, release into uh, these uh, sewage. So new standardized technologies to measure their significant, especially the secondary microplastic should be there. So it is the worst of the times, but it is the best of times because still we have a chance because we are alive. Thank you.